we will quickly transition into the morning discussion, uh, which is um, going to, in some ways, also bring Russia into the room again, yeah. post uh, the morning uh, plenary address. Um, not because uh, Russia does anything different to what anyone else is doing, but clearly the battle lines are being redrawn or, in fact, being conceived of uh, in the digital domain. And to discuss the emergence of a new field, which is going to engage all of us, a field where geopolitics, geoeconomics, and technology are now irreversibly um, joined uh, to put before us um, new questions that we need to respond to uh, is on us, that age of geotech is on us. And this panel is going to try and understand if this is um, uh, true, if this is uh, something that uh, is uh, merely uh, uh, chatter, or are we beginning to see a new dimension being added to how nations, communities, and people engage with each other. To join us to discuss this, we have an excellent uh, panel. We have uh, Vivek Lal, Vice President with Lockheed Martin. Um, it's a company that has worked in the security sector forever. Uh, in the <laughs> and uh, of course, increasingly, uh, as they uh, plan their businesses, uh, the future tech and the future of technology is going to implicate the sector deeply. Certainly, their supply chain, certainly the customer bases, the consumer markets are all going to dramatically alter. Uh, to my left is Clone Kitchen. I can't tell you what he did, nor can he. But, <laughs> but uh, um, he did good stuff. And now he's with the Heritage Foundation who's wor and working in the technology sector. Uh, he has been with uh, the government before this. And um, uh, he and I have particularly uh, been discussing something around uh, black box algorithms and how uh, strategic thinking is going to change as technology begins to uh, get embedded in uh, who we are and be become a part of us. To my right is Sean Kanu. He wears multiple hats. Um, he's a distinguished fellow at ORF. He runs his own consulting firm on technology. He's the head of the, he's the research director for the Global Commission on Cyberspace. And uh, uh, Sean is uh, one of the brightest folks you will meet who understands politics, technology, and uh, uh, trends, and global trends. And that's something that he did for a while. And last but not the least is Cara Frederick, the brightest voice in DC on um, everything tech and everything security. And um, uh, she uh, is certainly good. Uh, someone I'm going to quiz on uh, what it does to how national security thinking is changing. Uh, because of the emergence of these technologies. Let me start with Sean first. In some ways, um, um, Sean, is this now an irreversible trend that countries see technology as a highly securitized sector? We are going to see an uncoupling, decoupling, unlocking of linkages between uh, various economies, various countries. We are going to see a, 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 a splinter net emerge. We are going to see um, uh, uh, these tech silos uh, where certain <clears throat> nations who believe and who think like each other work in those silos? And are we going to see a new form of export control and tech control regimes emerge in the fourth IR? Short question. Yeah, so we start with 10 <laughs> questions all at once. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to say it's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, and as Samir alluded, a lot of my work in formerly in the US intelligence community was on strategic trend analysis, particularly in the tech area. So that's right. I'll start here. Uh, I see a couple very major trends. Uh, are they irreversible? I don't think anything in social sciences is necessarily irreversible. But I think these are some very strong trends. And the two major causal factors I see for this decoupling of joint tech innovation efforts and other cooperation is, first, a sense of zero-sum economic competition. We're seeing a lot of that with populist politics. Uh, I could make an argument that behind both Brexit or the Trump administration was a large effort to promote nationalism and economic nationalism, playing to a voter base who felt they were their jobs were at risk, their economic livelihood, and their competitiveness was at risk, uh, leading to certain actual regressive policies in both nations. Uh, so I think that stems from a fear that technology is both displacing workers' futures and will be the source of future wealth. So whoever can get these capabilities first will succeed in a comparative advantage sense, ergo in a global trade sense. 
The second issue I see, obviously, is the one, other one you alluded to, is the idea of a national security arms race. A couple of years ago, President Putin came out and said that whoever uh, leads an AI will be the most powerful nation in the world. We certainly see the national investment and political statements of China suggesting that they see leadership in AI and quantum as a platform for national power, projection internationally, as well as for regime control and stability domestically. So when I look at those two macroscopic trends of economic competition and national security concern, it doesn't really come as any surprise that we're seeing unilateral innovation. I mean, let's, the easiest comparative an analog would be the development of nuclear power. We certainly, in the US, held the Manhattan Project very, very closely. Ultimately, others had their own scientific innovation, often with the assistance of reverse engineering through espionage. That was a highly competitive process. Now we do have some cooperation in civil nuclear facilities around the world, but military applications and national security is still a very competitive field. So we're obviously talking globally here, but it's probably worth a minute or two to look at a couple regions, and I do want to bring it to India-US relations as well, since that's our focus of discussion here. In this area of innovation on a unilateral basis and of competitive trade barriers, tariffs, as we're certainly seeing between the US and China lately in this political contest, we also notice that the national security and defense doctrines are encouraging and promoting this. Uh, in the United States, we see it with some of our cyber command and defense doctrines for unilateral leadership. Uh, when I read the wordings of persistent engagement, defend forward, maintain full maneuverability and deny the same to your adversary, those are not necessarily cooperative doctrines. And this is not a judgment. It's just a plain black and white text reading. Uh, if I go to Europe and I read about data localization, and judicial and other political restraints, uh, those again are uh, regionalistic and or nationalistic measures that are meant to give uh, domestic and regional advantage. So where does that leave us? And you know, we have export-import controls such as Wassenaar um, agreement. Now that's very difficult with software code to monitor its proliferation or its export, but we've seen legislative efforts along those lines, and I think we're going to see more. At the end of the day, on the interoperability side of technology, it's actually not at the technical level. Okay, We have world standards. We have commercial applications that can bridge the equivalent of different rail gauges, as we've done in the past. You used to have round houses where the two rail systems came together so you could translate. But we can do that between different technical standards. But what we're seeing more and more is economic barriers and political barriers to this technological cooperation and joint innovation, the equivalent of customs houses and passport control desks. Hmm. That risk of a polarization or splinterization, balkanization, we hear a lot of terms, uh, and this certainly isn't the first conference to mention it. I think we can go back two or three years mm -hmm. and find conferences here in DC or elsewhere about the balkanization of the internet. But what really concerns me is this zero sum, both economic and national security arms race, and a complete reluctance to communicate because of these populist political uh, constituencies who are demanding uh, almost affronts against different entities. Uh, I'll end coming back to uh, India. Before you end, let me uh, ask you one, because, you know, sure. uh, I think we have, in your opening remarks, you have, um, by capturing the economic and security dimensions, um, perhaps we have uh, skirted over the the real social societal implication. Uh, for example, in the city we are in, there is a large constituency that would, be, that would believe that the Russians had a huge uh, role in your elections. There are many other countries where, who would argue that uh, regime stability, democracy itself is under threat. And how does that tie into uh, the leaders being able to put together these two? Well, sure. Now, I would group those aspects, actually, of regime stability, if you're coming from a Chinese or a Russian viewpoint, 
or national security and protection of democratic institutions, I would group those under national security, security. concerns. Okay. So certainly when we look at the two federal indictments of the Internet Research Agency and the GRU officers mm -hmm. for meddling in the 2016 election, or we look at Trump's recent acknowledgement that U.S. Uh, defense and intelligence capabilities were employed in the 2018 interim elections against the IRA, mm -hmm. Uh, I certainly group that under national security. national security because it is a fundamental interest. And I think, again, when we look at democratic institutions, that would be a national security interest, both of the United States, some of our European partners, mm -hmm. and India, certainly, as the world's largest democracy. Now, one thing that is very interesting when I look at India's work in some of this technology area is certainly in the area of AI and their development. Mm -hmm. If you read the white paper, I believe it was about 18 months ago, okay. It's fascinating because it has a different flavor to it than the Chinese and the American ones. It has a chapter on agriculture. It talks much more about health. It has a lot of these more social applications discussed in it. Uh, I personally think that's not only a productive approach, but it's obviously one that merits uh, attention in India. I think some other countries could take a little bit of a lesson from it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I certainly don't believe that the national security implications are lost on India. Mm -hmm. I know issues of sectarian violence and terrorism, whether domestic or from your very close neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, is a superior concern for uh, national security issues. So at the trend level, I'm concerned about zero-sum economic competition perceptions. I'm understandable. I, I comprehend it, but it's also a destabilizing factor the national security arms race and how this is being dealt with and invested independently in a number of countries. But I'm not purely pessimistic because I look at what India has done in some degrees and I hope other nations will follow by publicly exploring and seeking cooperative innovation partnership for many of the humanitarian applications of some of these wonderful technologies. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Vivek, let me turn to you. Um, you know, it's not uh, uncommon for governments to um, use national security to uh, reverse, change, modify uh, trading economic relationships. Um, and I was just getting into the rhythm. You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> but um, um, what is different this time is that the decoupling is now being uh, driven by the security community. And there is a perception that the industry may not be as, um, em you know, as embracing of this idea as uh, the governments are. So it is actually a government-led uh, uh, uncoupling, decoupling, restrictive regimes that are being created. Uh, being in the private sector, uh, how do you see this trend implicating business that is global by definition, and certainly for a company like uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, which has security in its design. You know, it, it's designed for security and national security purposes. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Samir, and thanks for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, on this issue of decoupling, I think that's an imperative. I think, um, however, I think there's some aspects that we have to keep in mind. Um, first is how do we preserve data security and our data loss? I think, I think that's an issue that is worthy of discussion. The second is how do you mitigate operational disruption? Um, the third thing that comes to mind is how do you migrate from legacy systems to new systems and, and, and what timeline is that? And finally, uh, systems integration difficulties. How, you know, so these are these are four aspects I think we have to keep in mind. However, deco decoupling in my in my mind is an imperative. Uh, digital decoupling, in terms of an approach, I think is best in a phased approach. Near term, it will certainly affect bottom lines of companies, um, mm -hmm. but the ROI will pay dividends, I think, in the longer term. Um, as a general comment, I do think global value chains have to be more secure, um, and, and they will become more secure. I think technical debt must be uh, reduced overall. In Lockheed Martin, for example, we're going through a dis digital transformation ourselves uh, currently, and, and we have got a very senior executive that's, uh, that's looking at that across the board of Lockheed Martin. Uh, Lockheed Martin uh, also, um, uses cognitive assistances, for example, to create digital engineering and manufacturing solutions and simulations. Um, 
we're also investing heavily in augmented reality, um, cognitive assistance, advanced ro robotics, autom autonomous device uh, decision making, and simulators. So these are some of the areas that, that we are focusing on. Um, and I think fundamentally we're shifting the, the question from um, mission, mission uh, requirements, capabilities, et cetera, and we are going to more of if this technology can do anything, what would it want, uh, what would we want it to do? And so that, that's an important transformation in, in some of our thinking. Um, and of course, finally, I'd want to say on this subject is, you know, tapping into high potential markets like India is key and, and, and that because it, it shapes new technologies and, and therefore you can invest in the right tech infrastructure. But the congressman just mentioned that India has uh, a very strong defense partnership. Uh, he didn't mention it. He was quite uh, uh, upset about that. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, he, he did uh, acknowledge that India has a robust defense partnership with uh, the Russians. Now, uh, when Lockheed Martin wants to engage with a, a market like India uh, uh, in a mood that Sean just described, uh, you know, uh, a highly securitized tech environment, uh, how do you navigate that space? Right, and so, you know, we've had, um, frankly, great success in India in, in navigating that space. Uh, we, in fact, announced late last year that uh, we will be uh, producing all future F-16 wings in India, as an example. Now, we, I think, are probably one of the first companies to take advantage of the STA-1 mm -hmm. um, uh, relaxation. relaxation, because in, in standing up that, that wing production and, and transferring that over, um, we're taking advantages of, I mean, in 2005, I think 25% of all um, exports, U.S. exports required licenses, and now it's down to 0.5%. So, I mean, if you look at the trend on, in terms of uh, export license, et cetera, it's very positive in favor of the U.S.-India relationship. And that's just one example. I mean, there are several other examples uh, in that regard. So Lockheed Martin remains bullish on India? Absolutely. Uh, even as uh, our congressman seems a little miffed with uh, the relationship. Right. <laughs> we, we, and we have a big footprint there. We have two joint ventures with Tata, and we have thousand people there, and so we, we remain bullish. Uh, thanks, uh, Vivek. Uh, Kara, let me turn to you. You heard him uh, list a number of new technologies that they are embedding into their defense systems. Mm -hmm. And perhaps uh, it is now no longer uh, technologies in defense systems, but technologies which are defense systems. And I think that's the uh, rethinking of uh, the whole nature of uh, conflict and conflict prevention and, and, and like he was mentioning, uh, dominance and, um, and forward uh, alignments that you were mentioning, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, ahead and, what was the word you used? Uh, defend, forward defense. Defend forward. Defend forward, that's right. So the forward defense, uh, active defense, as they also mentioned in um, the network, uh, Irina, a few years ago. How does technology change the strategic order as we have built it since uh, we devised the nuclear weapons and we created a whole new uh, framework around it? And um, what does it do to how countries now, uh, in, how do they align their security interests in this new domain? Yeah, so I, I think this is a really interesting question. And I'll pull back a little bit because the way we talk about technology before, especially in the national security and uh, defense sectors, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, talk of AI and the diffuse nature of this technology. And instead of emphasizing a platform like a MQ-9, we're emphasizing the mission first. Mm -hmm. And then we're, using, uh, we're emphasizing the software over the payload, which we're also emphasizing over the platform too. So technology is this um, sort of really, uh, it's an enabler, right? It's a, it's a force multiplier to use some of the state language of defense. But, um, but what I think is even more interesting, so technology, diffuse, you can apply it to um, uh, many different defense applications. Software is kind of key now. Um, but what's more interesting is the contest, and you alluded to it, the, a balance of power, maybe a shift here, um, maybe some sort of a confrontation between systems of governance. 
And when we think about technology, just in, in general terms, it was sort of supposed to be the, the great liberalizer of our age, the great democratizer. It was supposed to set people free, especially with regard to their entrenchment in uh, repressive regimes. Um, it gave them a reason to, to sort of hope and coordinate and organize protests and whatnot. But right now, given that we're seeing this growing contest between free and open societies and repressive and liberal regimes, I would argue that technology can stand to alter the balance. Um, if you look at next year, 30 billion devices are expected to be connected to the internet. Uh, five years after that, five billion people will have access to the web. This is a massive attack surface, first and foremost, but secondly, when you're thinking less of the sort of hard shoring up of our, our technical imperatives, you sort of stand to think that those who control, process, and exploit all of that data, they're going to stand to, to win. They're going to have at least a lot of power. And what technology, especially with regard to artificial intelligence, does is it concentrates power in the hands of a few. So it essentially helps autocracies and authoritarian regimes do what they do best. And sort of breaking it out, uh, three things. It helps authoritarians uh, enforce control through messaging, so it helps increase the breadth, uh, the efficiency, and the precision of things like propaganda. Um, uh, AI research firm OpenAI, uh, they released their GPT-2 model, which they restricted aspects of its code to the public because they were really afraid that it could act as a scalable fake news generator. So things like that in the information space, governments can stand to sort of dominate that using new models, new technology. Um, that particular model use, uh, uses natural language processing, which really helps people or computers get at the semantic interpretations of text. And then secondly, uh, artificial intelligence and emerging technology helps people, or authoritarians rather, monitor their internal populations through digital surveillance. Um, an interesting report, and I hate plugging other think tanks, but I am sitting in Heritage right now, and uh, an interesting report from Carnegie even came out this week, and it was on AI surveillance tech, and it, it said that uh, China has exported AI surveillance tech to 63 countries. Yep, and six, uh, 36 of those are BRI countries, so those who have signed on the dotted line for uh, China's patronage, really. Um, and then third, uh, AI really helps authoritarians detect patterns and influence their behavior in a way. Uh, a lot of great reporting, credit where it's due to Humans, Human Rights Watch, which has sources on the ground in the western province of Xinjiang, um, which I'm sure by now everybody's already heard, one to 1.5 million Uyghurs in um, effectively concentration camps slash re-education camps uh, there. And what they do is they, uh, Chinese authorities basically influence their behavior by preventing them from going to one village to another based off of digital surveillance. You know, these um, actual uh, uh, license plate readers connected to facial recognition and, and gateways that they have to pass through and they're monitored um, using a mix of human intelligence, but also digital surveillance as the thing that really helps China keep tabs on those uh, particular minorities. Um, so those are three things that artificial intelligence generally um, and, and technology can help authoritarians do well. Um, and, you know, we have to confront it on the tech side, too. We have to make sure some of our systems are shored up and hardened against um, information inc incursions. Um, we need to, this whole race that Sean talked about, it's really a race for talent. So we need to make sure that we are um, effectively having um, uh, private companies uh, encourage STEM training, um, maybe tax cuts for, um, for the companies that want to uh, do the STEM training. Um, immigration reforms are necessary, H-1B visas, you know, let highly skilled workers uh, come in. Let's try to keep them, let's, let's try to keep them here as well. But essentially treating talent as a strategic imperative is, is critical. But the last thing and the most important thing that I would argue is governance. So tech governance. Standards and governance are really the weapons that China is using somewhat surreptitiously in international standards bodies um, and the way they're exporting the laws and policies that govern this technology. And I'll point to one example in Vietnam. Vietnamese officials were trained in and ultimately implemented a 2018 cybersecurity law, which basically says that service providers have to give the data to the government without a warrant or a court order. Um, when you look at the technology transferring itself, okay, that's important. IP theft, espionage, really important. But it's really the laws and the policies that govern this technology that enable more of an authoritarian bent uh, to spread in the world. I, I think that is something we need to focus on. And I think democracies like the United States and India, we have to fight back. And I can offer some suggestions to do so in the q I'll, And I'll come to you uh, on that as we uh, move to the later part of this discussion. Sean, I'm going to come to you with... Uh, 
uh, I'm going to pose two questions that actually she has posed for all of us to think about. The first is, um, in the age where the raw material for your security now is human talent, is the most strategic asset, how does nationalism help in that when immigration and anti-immigrant sentiments are at the rise? Which countries are going to be able to source good talent to build this uh, a new arsenal that we need in the And the second, I think, point that she spoke about, but uh, in a sense did not directly uh, deal with, which I want both of you to talk about is, are we seeing the rise of the new sovereign, which is the big companies, and are they a new dimension in geopolitics? Are we moving beyond the state-to-state -state conflict, and are we now talking about uh, the industry becoming an actor? So I'll come back to you. Clone, let me uh, pose my questions to you. The same, similar questions, how will, um, how has technology changed our strategic approaches? And as predictive tech, AI, uh, IOTs, and, and the bots become uh, everyday um, uh, tools, or rather become the means, uh, how will our threat assessments and our responses to uh, these threats uh, be altered? Yeah, it's, uh, great. So uh, there's been a couple of really good comments on uh, the first part of that question in terms of the implications of technology and geopolitics. So I'll just make maybe one or two summary observations. Uh, one, I think it's, it's now undeniable that technology is the key enabler of modern statecraft. So whatever the mission of the state is, whether it be internal governance, international politics, national security and defense, none of those aspects of state, modern statecraft are left untouched decisively by the evolution of technology. And so that's why it's dominating every conversation that we have, right? So to put that in, in, a, in a kind of explicit particular way, when we think about national security, what governments and individuals and militaries are inescapably drawn to, the conclusion, is that to secure a nation is to secure networks. And to secure networks is to secure supply chains. Mm. There's no escaping that. That is almost a natural law in the modern world at this point. Mm. That then introduces all kinds of complexities in the global economic system and international order. And what you're watching is the international order and the global economic system struggle with that new reality. Mm. That's why we're having these conferences and these conversations. Right, so I think that's my kind of summary judgment of the strategic situation that, mm. that we're facing. Mm. Now, Samir asked a very good question in terms of the particular implications of technological development in defense. Mm. And um, I'll, make, I'll make a couple of, of observations on that. As we go forward, as, as an individual who, you know, I come out of the national security community here in the United States, um, artificial intelligence is one of those technologies that actually offers the opportunity that it, it may actually live up to the hype. Now, there's a lot of marketing right now, and it's not quite, you know, quite what we think it, what it, what it is, but it very well could be. And uh, modern militaries are very interested in realizing that because if artificial intelligence does become what it promises, it will be a decisive advantage. And everybody knows that. And so what I'm assuming is, is that one, as artificial intelligence comes online, we're going to know more than we've ever known before. One of the kind of force multiplying implications of artificial intelligence is that we will be able to ingest and interrogate and leverage volumes of data that we would have never been able to dream before. Number one, because most of that data wasn't digitized in the first place. Mm. That's happening. And what artificial intelligence does is allows you to engage that data, that newly digitized data, at scale and to draw connections between those data uh, variables in ways that no human ever could because it's able to interrogate it at a speed and a scale that no human ever could. So we're going to know more than we've ever known before. But we're also uh, not always going to know how we know things. Mm. So we're going, you know, it, it will be an incremental evolution, our dependency on these AI. So in the same way that you or I may uh, throw open uh, Google Maps and uh, it quickly tells us how to get home, we're not, we're not aware of all the variables that that is accounting for. We have a general working knowledge of that, right? But it's ingesting and, and leveraging a whole host of data points that we've never thought about and that we're frankly not even kind of critical of. We just say, well, OK, it's working, right? Well, Samir mentioned this at the beginning when he introduced me. 
So AI researchers actually have a, a, a vocabulary for this when AI is able to produce or is, is, is taking uh, on actions that we can't fully explain. It's called black box problems. So often you can point artificial intelligence algorithms at one another and give them a task and just task them with making that, that more efficient. And they will discover ways within themselves of how to do that more efficiently that we can't explain. We, we open the hood, we look at the numbers, and we can't articulate why it's making the judgments that it is. All we can do is look at the inputs on the front side and the outputs on the back side and say, yeah, it's more efficient, and yep, they're ingesting the right data. I don't know what's happening in the magic black box in the middle. Well, that's going to happen in national security and defense issues. It's going to, it's artificial intelligence as applied to military and national security implications is going to render judgments that we're not going to be able to fully explain. That has all kinds of ethical dilemmas. So at the point where we have, say, a political military analytic AI, we're not close yet, but that's where we want to go. And it assesses that country A is 24 hours from conducting a hostile military exercise against country B. And we task our human analysts to verify that judgment. There's no guarantee that they'll be able to do that. But that AI up until this point has always been correct. It's completely reliable. What then do policymakers decide? Do they take a preemptive judgment, a preemptive action based on that? So these are the types of ethical dilemmas we're going to be running into. Um, also, AI is going to be authoritative until it isn't. So in the same way that you hop into your car and you flip on Google Maps and you're driving home, well, the first time Google Maps sends you to Delaware instead of Maryland, <laughs> you've got a problem. And maybe you switch apps, and maybe you never use that again. Well, the same thing's going to be the case here. All a, a, an enemy would have to do is inter interject a sufficient level of doubt into the da underlying data or the outcomes that our national security AIs produce or leverage, and then our entire military national security decision-making process is now in flux. Mm. Right? And distrust in technology. Distrust in technology and underlying. And, and just so you know, the idea of data manipulation as a strategy for undermining superior capability, that is a doctrine. And then finally, just before you cut me off, as you should, um, the scale and speed of these threats. So when we think about, for example, uh, hypersonic missiles, there's all kinds of reasons why we would naturally oppose lethal AI technologies. All kinds of reasons. Huge ethical problems that come with that. At the same time, the scale and speed of AI-enabled capabilities almost demands that we will move toward type of automation capabilities. And if you want a key example, on uh, American and allied naval ships, uh, there's a gun called a Sea Whiz. And currently, it has the ability to automatically identify, track, and engage uh, a threat to that ship. And it it only by rules requires human intervention for it to fire, but it has the full capability to do so. We have that rule because currently the threats that that weapon would have to engage are still sufficiently recognizable that allows us decision time to make that choice. But at the point where the weapon that is engaging us is too fast for that, what choice do we have but to automate the capability? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the a lot of the ethical challenges of AI-enabled warfare, and ultimately even broad, more broadly, AI-enabled statecraft, we're at the beginning of all this. We haven't even fundamentally begun to define those issues, let alone engage them meaningfully. You know, I'm going to uh, just uh, put out a question there, which I'm going to come back to. All of you want to take it on, but certainly I would like Cloen and uh, Kara and Sean to think about it. And Vivek I'm, is not going to take a position on that because he's, he, he holds the intellectual property, so he's not going to reveal the solution. Uh, but if the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis was happening today, hmm. I would love to know how the two sides would be thinking. Uh, uh, there we were trying to guess what the Russian leader is thinking and what Kennedy would do and what McNamara would advise him. And you, know, you had people who you were trying to predict. Uh, what would an AI uh, uh, age Cuban Missile Crisis. Look, I come to you at the end of the panel, but think about it. Let me go to Sean to respond to what Kara just uh, mentioned in her presentation. First off, I want to commend both Klan and Kara for their analytic comments. I absolutely agree with nearly the entirety of everything they said. 
And before I go to your question, I want to underscore two points you made, Cara, that were fantastic, but may have gone under the radar screen here a little bit. First, a lot of folks look at AI as a possible for opening up new defensive applications. If you heard her presentation, mm -hmm. she highlight how effective it's going to be for offense as well. And in fact, you're not hearing about all those innovations because most of them are in closed defense and intelligence channels. I personally feel and agree, I believe with you, that AI in the near term is going to be more advantageous to offense than to defense. Mm -hmm. And that's really critical when we think about our security thinking. Secondly, she noted the accumulation of power in smaller hands, fewer and fewer groups. I believe that security disparity is going to be true both among nations, you're going to have the haves and the have-nots, as well as within nations, where you're going to have very highly powered individuals and corporations who are going to increasingly get a higher percentage of the wealth and influence. So I think those are two really important trends that you know, credit to you for saying them, but I want to actually reiterate those for the audience. Now, over to the issue of talent and new sovereigns. Really simple here. There are two ways to get a talent working for you. You either pay them or you compel them. <laughs> uh, and the talent in this area is not about we put out 40,000 PhDs this year. I, my background is particularly in cybersecurity. And of all the important zero days that have been found in the world, the never seen before compromises, mm -hmm. there are about 300 human beings on the planet who have found them. Not 300 people in the US Defense Department, not 300 in all of the billion plus people in India, 300 on the planet. I call these the Olympians, and these are the people who will make the game-changing innovation. And what are the degrees they have? Uh, some of them are self-grown hackers. Some of them are PhD computer scientists. Some of them come out of certain military and intelligence establishments where they train and nurture those capacities. But my point is, the real game-changers are individuals who are going to have those eureka breakthrough moments. In order to get them working for you, either as direct employment staff or contractors, you're not paying them a GS-13 federal civil servant salary. Okay, It's just not working when they're getting offered a million dollars a hit for finding certain zero days under bug bounty programs or under national uh, government systems who seek to accumulate those capabilities. Now you have other regimes who seek to compel individuals to work for them. Uh, the flip side of the immigration and visa problems, uh, problems I'll say we hear retaining talent, is that some of these individuals from places like China are being strongly encouraged we'll to return home and work in fields that support their national security establishment. And strongly encouraged can mean a good salary, benefits, and could also mean that suddenly your parents and your family will no longer be denied social and economic privileges in that country. Compellants, no, this is really serious. I just came back from Shanghai a, a week ago, and crossing a street, there's a video screen on the lamppost showing people crossing the street who are jaywalking and repeatedly showing their images to publicize <laughs> it. And that's, of course, affecting your social credit score because they've tracked you based on facial recognition and gait recognition. It is all happening in real time, and they have it up on the signpost on a video screen for you. So you know that the big state is watching you and affecting your social credit score. Now, over to the new sovereign companies. I, coming from that social credit theme, mm -hmm. data is the source of this new power. And the integrity of that data, the ability to process it, very critical. Some companies are leading in that work. But again, it's the sovereigns who actually have the police power. In Russia, we see that every time a company becomes too powerful, or an oligarch does, suddenly there's a tax authority raid on their offices and homes. Uh, under Chinese national security law, every Chinese entity, whether at home or abroad, and any Chinese citizen, whether at home or abroad, has obligations to the Chinese state under their national security laws. So as long as you permit the police power and the monopoly of physical force to be in states, they still will continue to have leverage over companies. I'm very curious to see how the emerging technology world plays out between AI, where in the cloud computing, the processing of this data, the new oil, as some people have argued, is largely being led by three North American companies. 5G technologies are currently being led 
by Asian and European, primarily one Asian, but it, European companies as well. Think about that, where the data processing power is going to be held in, one, in the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. and the transport capability to get the value of that data to where it can be leveraged for autocratic purposes, military purposes, or good mm -hmm. social purposes, is going to be controlled by someone who happens to be doing all kinds of subsidies and influence through BRI. So that's a future tension that I see very interesting. But I'll stop there. Look forward to hearing others' thoughts on these. No, I, I would like to uh, ask, uh, Carol actually expand, uh, expand on uh, that point, you know, uh, disaggregated uh, uh, power uh, in, in smaller hands, and perhaps also then look at the aggregated power in single hands, like the corporate power. Yep. In, Exactly. Um, so I, I, before this, um, I worked at Facebook, so a big monolith of, of private industry. And um, I think the rise of the private sector is something that they are going to have the biggest impact in this world. And they, I mean, they already are in terms of, um, and I said this yesterday at the Politico's AI Summit, I mean, the, or two days ago, but the the fact that the private sector matters so much right now, and yet the the geopolitical cognition that they have is waning. I mean, just uh, anecdotally, I mean, we would go in and we would talk about you know some of these big terrorism problems, and uh, the C-suite guys would be like, okay, so what's the technical fix? You know, how do we fix this technically? That kind of thing. So it, it's changed now. It's definitely evolved since 2015, 2016. Um, but I think that there has been a, a dearth in, in you know, the willingness of the government to assign responsibility to companies for their actions, and then the a lack of companies sort of realizing their own power. Um, now, now they get it. Um, I think it, increasingly so. But if you look at things like um, Microsoft's incursions into global governance, like they have a digital C Geneva <laughs> Convention, um, they're uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, propagating programs that are basically saying we're going to help defend uh, democracy and we're going to do it, you know, digitally. And all of the the companies are increasingly getting in the game because they know the impact that they have. And then when it comes to the surveillance systems that can sort of concentrate power in people's hands, um, I, I talk a lot about um, facial recognition on, and law enforcement and as a, you know, a public safety tool and uh, privacy people are, are up in arms about that um, and how it can impinge on your individual liberties. But I think it, it also, we need to look at private industry and what they can do with the variety and the, the amount of data that they've been collecting for years and years and years, often under the radar. Um, IBM was involved in a scandal when it came to light in uh, late last year. Uh, they were combing Flickr. You know, everybody used to post on Flickr and that kind of thing. And they're combing Flickr and they're using it um, for their facial recognition databases. And they're not telling anyone. There's no notification that facial recognition is being, the algorithms are being tweaked on your own and your grandma's faces at all. That's not happening. Um, so law enforcement, yes, we, uh, you know, America has a bulwark, and I talk about this a lot, but we have a bulwark, uh, a set of system of practices and a system to act against abuses of, of, this, of these technologies, like um, sufficient rule of law protections, an independent judiciary, a free press, um, an engaged citizenry. We, we have a system of governance that protects us from those abuses. Um, however, I don't, I don't think that's enough. Um, I think as people sort of recognize the, the impact of the private sector, um, you, if you look at the latest Pew poll, Facial recognition systems are trusted by um, Americans to uh, be used by police officers responsibly. 56% of Americans say that. Um, but when it comes to trusting private companies, that's where everybody's like, oh, like this is an actual problem. So I think um, the private sector is going to play an outsized role in all of this. And not that we need to keep an eye on them, but we, we need to assign responsibility and they need to take responsibility for what happens within the quarters of their own organizations. Uh, Vivek, I'm going to turn to you on this question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to explore the larger dimensions of private sector decision-making po uh, points today that they uh, grapple with. The first, of course, is her question, trust and citizen trust, and uh, how do you um, uh, respond to um, this whole proliferation of misuse of, of personal information by a number of industries. So I'm looking at an industry-level question to you. But the second is, uh, and it was really interesting for me when you said decoupling is an imperative. Uh, and you know, this is really in interesting that here is a private sector company uh, and not many private sector company, uh, uh, private sector people will go out there and put this on the table, that decoupling is an imperative. Now, this time, of course, the answer is decoupling is an imperative because you believe there is a certain value system that you want to decouple from. When is this going to end? You could decouple with anyone based on certain value differences. So my question here is, 
that that uh, when you move down the slippery road of decoupling, you would find occasions to decouple with India, to decouple with with Australia. So some days, if they beat you in football, American football, it's not going to happen. They play rugby, but uh, you know you could decouple on any number of reasons, and any regime could find enough reasons to show incompatibility with uh, with uh, uh, another entity who was formerly a, a ally or a partner. So how is the private sector? Uh, creating this new relationship with the public at large, and how are they making choices around this decoupling that you did mention? Excellent question, uh, Samir. So what I can offer there is, you know, we look at it from, from in six stakeholder buckets, if you will, to have this conversation or to look at the, the issues, whether it's private or public. Um, and, and the six buckets, uh, in my mind, are, are the following. One is the political spectrum, and we're talking US-India, so um, the political spectrum in both countries. Uh, the second bucket would, would be the bureaucracy. So the bureaucrac bureaucratic policies, procedures, norms, and how they align or don't align and, and what needs to be do done in, in that sphere. Third would be the industry captains. And uh, that's both private industry as well as public industry. Uh, the, the fourth, uh, I would say, is academia and think tanks, like, like we have many represented here today. Uh, they, again, would play a, an important role um, in, in, in building that trust, uh, if you will. Um, uh, then I would say is communications and media, right? So the, that's a very powerful platform, especially social media, and, and how some of these things are communicated. And finally, it's the end user of some of these technologies we're talking about like artificial intelligence. And I'll just give you an example. We just signed an MOU earlier this year with an Indian company called Sastra Robotics. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they uh, actually are able to test avionics displays. It's a, it's a startup company in India, but they've partnered now with Lockheed. And this is an example of how we, they are going to then um, test uh, startup displays in, in, in our fighter aircraft that we produce. And, this is a small example, but it's an example of how we create bridges uh, company to company and, and, and the startup environment, again, is very rich with some of the technologies we're talking about. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure in your business you don't have a retail market, so you're not trying to win over trusts of, uh, of, of consumers. I mean, thank God everyone doesn't have an F-16, right? <laughs> you're, you're angry with your neighbor and you take your F-16 and settle the dispute on the garbage can. But... Um, uh, uh, are you rethinking the way you are beginning to use data in your business processes? Yes, absolutely. And that's what I mentioned in my earlier remarks is we, we have a huge initiative of digital transformation within the company. And it, it's more than digitalizing. It, it, it's really re process re-engineering and, and how we think through um, how we currently do business and all the processes uh, that are involved there. So, yes. Great. Uh, so I'm going to open it up, but before we do that, I'm going to come on that Cuban missile crisis. And now they're going to tell us that in the age of black box algorithms, let's start with you, Claude. In the age of black box algorithms, how would that have, how would that conversation have unfolded? <laughs> I mean, if you can call it a conversation. Uh, it'll be a conversation. It just may not be between people. Um, so what I'm going to do, this is, a, this is an interesting thought exercise. I didn't know I was going to be doing it. But um, let's, let's take the Cuban missile crisis and transport it into, you know, two decades into the future. So as I talk about this, I may be <laughs> going back and forth between decades. But, uh, okay, so let's say someone walks into the president's office and says, Madam President, um, we have indications that uh, our artificial intelligence uh, algorithm has identified with 98% certitude, the presence of intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba that are within range of the entire United States. And uh, that is something that we can't countenance. What do we do? The president says, okay, well, uh, Director CIA, what is, uh, what is the Putin AI saying in terms of why it might be doing? You know, the, you know we, we think that's funny, but there's enough kind of, we do psychological assessments already, right. right? And there's enough open source data in terms of biography, in terms of biology, in terms of previous political decisions and processes that these individuals have done publicly otherwise to inform that type of capability. And so the president turns to the director of CIA and says, okay, what does the Putin AI say is the intentions in, uh, behind this choice? 
And they say, well, Madam President, 32% chance is just belligerence and, you know, General so-and-so has just gotten uh, President, Pu or President Putin's ear. 82% uh, chance, those numbers don't work, 70-something uh, percent chance uh, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's the precursor to a first strike capability that they want to use in the upcoming, you know, election, uh, negotiations or whatever. Uh, the president then turns and says, okay, listen, I need the gamed scenarios that have my AI in an adversarial position with Putin's AI. I need the NATO ally, AI uh, factored in as well. And then do a quick scrub of, um, you know, the latest political conditions and come back to me with uh, response options. Right? And so they report back and say, okay, 32% chance of success if you choose this course of action, 62% chance of success if you take this action, 12% chance if you choose this action, right? And to some degree, those metrics will have some legitimacy. At the same time, they are almost certainly going to, over the course of time, engender a type of false reliability. Mm. Because on the variables that it includes, it's able to make a determination. But there's all kinds of intangibles to human activity that aren't factored in. But the presence of metrics mm. offers a psychological assurance that a decision maker in that moment is going to be highly receptive to. And we're not sure what that's going to mean. On top of that, of course, there's going to be the normal response options that we'd explain in terms of, OK, look, we need AI uh, you know, enabled cyber capabilities. Is there anything that we can do that's non-kinetic that can take this out or somehow? We also, you know, Department of Homeland Security, uh, I need you know, an AI-informed threat mitigation and incident response plan, right? The factors in all the weather factors so that if a bomb were actually launched, landed in Manhattan, where does it go? How many people? All that stuff, right? So the point here is, is in the scenario that Samir's offered up, there is no aspect of the decision-making process that goes untouched by something like AI. And that's because, and that's, again, this is to kind of reiterate my, my, my previous point in terms of modern statecraft. Why people talk about artificial intelligence the way they do is because it's the new general purpose technology, right? It's, it's, like, it's like the combustion. The, the steam engine and the internal combustion engine, right? Mm. It, its implications transcend Every sectors, sector. right? And so there's nothing that goes untouched by it. That's why it feels so consequential, is because not all technologies are like that. This is one of those things. Uh, and so uh, modern statecraft, as I said before, is going to be driven by these types of capabilities. Sean, how would you have solved the crisis? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let me start with AI is going to be akin to electricity and how it changes every single aspect of life. Uh, I like Klon's uh, intellectual framework for working through this scenario we've all been put on the spot with, so I'll run with it as well. Uh, first of all, each side is going to be having its AI algorithms that it's used to inform them, and those algorithms will have been massive targets of each other's intelligence apparatuses for corruption. Uh, data poisoning, adversary, data poisoning during the training phase of those algorithms, adversarial inputs during the implemented phase of those, and reverse engineering of their black box resultants will all be massive objectives by the adversary. So just like in certain aspects, you won't know if a gun will fire, if your supply chain was corrupted, or if your uh, airplane can lock on to the adversary, you won't actually know if your AI has been compromised or not. Now, having been one of those people who used to go into the sit room and at least in respect of cyber attacks, be repeatedly asked by national security staff, what certainty do we have in this assessment, Mr. Canug? And knowing that that's a really tall order because someone's going to make a policy decision based on it. Yet they're looking for justification. Mm -hmm. And not only will your AI programs be compromised, potentially, but the human who is kept in the loop for ethical reasons will be a substantial target of disinformation, even if only to delay their decision-making ability. I'm going to drill down on two really fine points that you should put into Klon's framework. First, it's going to be in a world where objective truth will be debated. Okay, The ship carrying the missiles will probably first be detected by a private sector company, and an AI there working on bills of lading or effluence in the ocean saying, what's going on here? This boat hasn't been properly registered to be traveling this exact course. 
So it's probably going to come from public awareness rather than government sources. And then sovereigns are going to have competing stories for what's happening. And what ultimately did Kennedy do? He threw a satellite photo on the table. Do you think a picture is still worth a thousand words in the era of deep fakes? <laughs> that satellite photo is going to be useless for persuading the public or a forcing function on Khrushchev. It's going to be he said, she said, just like why MH17 went down over Ukraine. I'm going to view this as a very muddied water where not only is the public going to be held uncertain because of competing realities, but people in the Kremlin and the White House sit room would both be struggling to determine if the 56.8% certainty the black box results is because that's its real result or because the other side has tamped it down through data poisoning. I'll stop there. It's not a pretty world I would look at. Samir, ma'am, just one, one interesting implication of this uh, as well um, in terms of the near ubiquity of digital information and data is that uh, intelligence is going to evolve in a, in, a, in a unique way in that there's already beginning to, to be a shift away from um, bespoke intelligence sources, kind of that, that particular person in that particular place who knows that one thing to leveraging near ubiquitous data and general open sources, right? So, so that it's, it's more agile and it's more data rich, right? So I would, I would wager to say that, you know, outside of some of the, the data poisoning points, which are spot on, um, that we are going to be transitioning in, in terms of the Western and, and, and American intelligence model to where majority of time we're gonna be dependent on general generally available information and be able to do as much, if not more, with that information mm -hmm. than we have done previously with bespoke intelligence sources. And that's something that we're wrestling with and trying to figure out. But if that's the case, mm -hmm. what that means is, is that outside groups, companies, are going to be doing the exact same, same thing, thing because they'll have the same access because they're the ones generating and processing the information. And what we call intelligence, they call market data. <laughs> and so the 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 national security burden is migrating to the private sector. And there's the, the state simply does not have the agility or the capability to rein that back. And sometimes the state even leverages it as well. If you look at ransomware attacks and whatnot, um, this blending of strategic intent between nation state actors and you know private industry and people who are just there to create chaos, like Legion Hulk in Mexico, um, I think that's going to get intensely murky. And it's going to we're all going to be the worse off for it unless we can actively determine and, and work off that. Um, so in my scenario, not to uh, belabor the point, um, our commercially viable um, uh, algorithms coded uh, properly to detect deep fakes and synthetic media will have worked. Um, <laughs> DARPA's <laughs> AI explainability program um, will have also been successful, so we'll be able to, to some degree, crack that black box that we talk about uh, in tandem. IARPA's um, identification of predictive trends um, that they're utilizing right now to try to discern whether or not an uprising is more likely in a specific area will also help. Um, the, again, commercially viable data visualization platforms that we buy from Lockheed Martin Martin um, will have uh, properly aggregated all the data to give us a, a higher percentage of assessment or prediction of, of what we think is going to happen. Um, and then the resources that help us get our heavy compute power in the United States will help us win the day um, in tandem with our own adversarial inputs into other people's systems to uh, make things look like they're happening so, so, that's not so happening. If, if, now, I want to take you back to the point you had raised. Uh, and in fact, uh, the point both of you had uh, emphasized on that. Um, Perhaps we are reaching a time, uh, and because this is so aggressive in design, tech, this new tech is so aggressive, it is not a defensive technology, it's an aggressive technology. Would you think we would even have that moment of conversations that uh, uh, you know JFK and his advisors and, and the Kremlin did? And uh, are we going to short circuit the human, and you, know, you said human int, bespoke intelligence, and human engagement? Are we changing the diplomatic turf itself? Is, is geopolitics of the future uh, leaving little room for the ethical human or the unethical human to intervene. Uh, again, I'm not a nuclear strategist, but you know, what was it? You had about 15 minutes to get on the red phone mm -hmm. back in the day. Hypersonic missiles 
you don't have it. You're not going to be able to get a call across the red phone before you'd have to make a decision if it was a real event. And of course, if we're talking about cyber German technologies, it's not going to be a matter of minutes or seconds. It's going to be a matter of fractions of seconds. Mm. So that goes to Klon's point about to have an effective national security, you're going to have to be asking the question, which functions do I automate, not only for information gathering, but also for response? And that's a really scary question, but that's the elephant in the room. Because if you are faced with a hypersonic missile with a nuclear warhead, or you are faced with a debilitating cyber attack against your critical infrastructures, you're not going to be able to call a principal's meeting and have them all drive through DC traffic to get to the sit room to decide what you want to do. Excellent. So I think I've seen a couple of um, folks wanting to jump into this conversation. Shruti, um, Javeer, uh, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, you want to start? Then we'll move down this road. I'm right. Mike anyway. <laughs> For, <laughs> first of all, I. I feel like I've attained a higher level of consciousness just having been in the room for this conversation. This is an extremely elevated, uh, high, high level discussion. It's really fascinating, especially for a non-tech person. Um, so my non-tech question is, as we move into this new age, this new AI age, um, if you had to grade our performance, where we are now, how is the United States doing in this competition? What do we need to do more of? Um, where are we in relationship to uh, our competitors and adversaries? And in an absolute sense, how prepared are we? I think um, uh, the four Americans on this panel should answer that. <laughs> I don't have a, a, a Trump AI yet to give that answer. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll start. Um, so I think in terms of our grade, I mean, I'd give us a B plus, but I think China uh, has a C plus or maybe a B, actually. Um, I think they are, they're, we're starting to come into uh, conversations where parity is discussed uh, in terms of um, the, I don't really like to call it a race, uh, you know, for AI. A lot of people talk um, through certain AI supremacy and whatnot. But I think right now, um, as someone I'll give credit to who is phenomenal, works with our organization, Elsa Kenya, who studies uh, Chinese uh, develop tech developments, um, she basically said, and, and this is accurate, um, it's, it's ours to lose right now. Um, but I, I do think we need to be worried about um, losing it. Um, one of the, the uh, statistics that, it, I mean, yeah, you can throw data out there and uh, infer whatever you will, but I think this is a good um, illustration of where we are right now. Um, in the, the uh, 60s, the United States, uh, their, our global R&D spending was 70% of international global R&D spending all in the, across the entire world. Um, now it is diminished considerably, and China is, is, is coming up quick. Um, they've surpassed us in their ability, uh, the, the number of AI research publications uh, that you know, the number itself, um, in terms of quality, there there's a convergence, they're almost there. Um, we're, we still retain dominant quality AI publications, but right now, um, China is, is quickly catching up. Um, similarly, their investments in talent, um, there's sort of, amongst China watchers, sort of a, a disagreement as to whether or not um, their talent cadre is, is, is crushing it or not. Um, when you talk about uh, the semiconductor industry in particular, which is um, obviously not AI, but like the, the chip design is essential for um, some of um, these elements too, especially as we get into AI optimized chips and whatnot, um, making it possible for things like facial recognition on smaller and smaller devices. Um, Right now, the United States leads in chip design, um, but China, um, this is ambitious, has said they want to basically dominate the semiconductor market by 2030. I don't think they're going to get there, but they're they're coming up fast, um, and they're sort of taking over every other aspect of the market. And we, we're still holding, you know, that IP. It's really hard, obviously, to um, m make good chips and and design them well. Um, but but China is, you know, they're they're seeking to encroach into that area too. So I think it's we need to be concerned. Um, and uh, decoupling, as you say, is an imperative. I think given um, the, the integrated nature of the supply chain um, and the, again, another imperative that we have to secure our supply chains, especially in the semiconductor industry, that's illustrative too of what's happening and how we, we do need to have more of a um, um, 
maybe not more of a defensive mindset, but we need to soberly assess some of the security risks. We're doing a good job. CFIUS did a great job in terms of some of the reforms that they made and the investments into uh, Silicon Valley startups um, and how a lot of that now um, China is sort of blind to some of that uh, IP that they had access to before. Um, so great, but we got to keep going. We have to just make sure that we know that this is a security risk as well. Um, and then people will say we need to also main, uh, keep innovation as you know the primary we, we can't stifle innovation with some of these safeguards um, but the fact is we we need to institute some of these safeguards um, with a, a, a little more intensity than perhaps in the past okay. now the, one, the one point I like to make on this question is that it's not about any specific technology in isolation uh, if you'll allow me to abuse the metaphor of the grading uh, AI would be one class on your report card it's your grade point average across AI, cyber, additive manufacturing, soon to be quantum, that's going to matter because it's actually the synergies and the synergistic mm -hmm. effect of using these technologies together that's going to be the revolutionizing game changer. Maybe it's a decade or so off or maybe two decades off, but when you're using quantum sensing of magnetometers and gravitometers to detect things that human perception is unable to, and you're applying AI to process that data, you're gonna render the, one example be, you'll render the oceans transparent to follow whale pods for ecological reasons or to detect adversarial submarines, okay? But you're gonna to need to be using quantum and AI to do that. So I asked the question, where are we versus China on AI? Where are we versus China on quantum? Other things, you gotta look at it holistically at that grade point average uh, I think we're ahead in some areas. I think we're behind in others. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, so that's, I like the GPA analogy very much. I think that's excellent. I, so the only thing I'll add to that is uh, in terms of grading, it's going to depend on, on what, what metrics you're talking about. So the United States, absolutely, uh, in terms of AI discovery and innovation, we have an agility and a diversity of research that is unparalleled globally. There's no doubt about that. Um, the, the material advantage that, that China seems to be demonstrating, however, is that the centrally managed <clears throat> project does have some advantages. Now, it's not going to be nearly as diverse um, and perhaps not generally as agile. At the same time, the Chinese government is able to direct considerable resources at the top priorities of the government. Mm. And so they're able to advance along those lines quite rapidly, and we've seen that. On top of that, the reason we're talking about AI right now is essentially because of a discovery, particularly the use of neural networks, uh, in, tw in 2012. That's essentially when that, that particular door was kicked down and we had enough comp computational power and digitized information and kind of computer science discovery to where, okay, we've changed the game on AI. But now we're in the age of AI implementation. And AI implementation, the barriers to that are far lower. The key for AI implementation is data. Mm. And the reality is, is that China does have a material advantage on data. Just, I mean, we've already talked in terms about their surveillance capability and everything else. Even culturally, there is just a lesser expectation of privacy and, and kind of digital constraint. And so what the, the race that we're, that we're watching and that, frankly, the, whose end is, is unclear is can China and other digitally enabled authoritarian regimes realize the benefits of technological authoritarianism faster than that type of authoritarianism erodes their societies? Mm. I don't know. Mm. That's an open question. But they could. Perhaps first time in history, authoritarian regimes may actually gain the capability to do the type of central planning that they've always required and wanted to do. And that's frightening. Hmm. I, I would agree with what all the panelists have suggested. The, the only aspect I would like to add is it's going to be, in my view, multidisciplinary optimization. So AI is certainly one very relevant and important aspect. But uh, augmented reality, quantum computing, as was mentioned, and how do you actually fuse these silos and optimize overall uh, will make the difference. And because we see a lot of silo formations as well. And, and, and we have to be cognizant of the, of the fact that there, there are 
many factors that go into the final grade, so to speak, of what we get. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I was recently in a conversation with uh, the world's first minister for AI uh, in the UAE government, uh, Minister Al Olama, and he had come down to Hamburg for one of our schools that we run for young leaders. And he mentioned something very interesting. He says, uh, uh, even if you were to um, proceed with that idea that data is power or data is oil, uh, whatever uh, commodity that works for you, um, as my colleagues from Facebook say, data is water. So, uh, you know, he did say that the, the diversity of data is equally important. And uh, China may have the largest pool of data, but China is Venezuela, uh, while Dubai is like Libya. We have uh, maybe not the same size, but we have such diverse data that moves through our airports, that moves through our cities, that does businesses. We have such diversity of data, and there is a dimension to that as well. So let's just keep that in mind. It's not for the panel, just uh, an observation I wanted to share. Um, you wanted to come in, Javir and uh, Shruti, right? So Javir, over to you. Uh, Kara, my question is to you. Um, I'm also a non-tech person. I can barely update my own PlayStation 4. <laughs> so that's a disclosure there. Uh, from a legal point of view, uh, we've been having conversation for the past two days on data flow, and you spoke about public trust. Now, there are two different trajectories India and US are on as far as public trust is concerned. I read uh, on 16th uh, antitrust panel, a House of Judiciary Committee has asked for documents from companies that how much privacy invasion or how do you manage your data. The conversation we are having in India is there's actually a petition in Supreme Court filed uh, saying that the social security, our equivalent, Aadhaar, should be linked with Facebook. Facebook is actually opposing it, that I don't want your social security number to be linked with me, but the government is yet to take a stand. <laughs> and the government in the past has said right to privacy is not a constitutional right. I will invade that right. So the two different trajectories. So the question is, you think... No, no, but that's not only India. Even Estonia has decided to give up anonymity to link them to a digital code. So it's not... So a... Samir has yet not taken me to Estonia, so I don't know about that. But <laughs> So I'm giving you that example. So what my question is... But do you think generally worldwide there's a pushback from uh, private companies that we might be open to further investigations or it's still very market specific where they think the public trust in the government is less, let's exploit this. And whereas in United Kingdom or US, say where the, uh, the so, scenes uh, uh, let, Let's take a step back. I think he's raised a very interesting point. And you can answer the specific question. But I think the bigger question for us is that the data governance models are different across the world. You have a data governance model, which is very mercantilist by design, which is the US. And by the way, the Californians are pushing back. They are coming up with their GDPR in, on testosterone from next year. So you have uh, a pushback. You have a, a European model, which is the GDPR. And you have an Indian GDPR plus model that India is proposing, where uh, identity, uh, where security takes supremacy over uh, privacy. And you are linking uh, data sets together. Is that going to impact uh, de development of technology, is that going to give you any geopolitical advantages as, as countries? Is any data governance model better than the others? Because we had heard, uh, you know, very eminent people like Joseph Nye claim um, uh, in the past that our innovation system is going to dominate China. I, I remember these famous last words from, uh, uh, you know, spoken by very eminent people. And I, they might be right. We don't know where the game is ending. But uh, the, all data points tell us today that China's compellent strategy, compellence in more than just managing human capital, has driven a certain uh, technological break, you know, industry for them. So my question to you is, do data governance regimes implicate uh, the, the, the new strategic order that is emerging? Hmm. Okay, can I phrase it in this way? <laughs> yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, and forgive me as I sort of sort through it in my own head um, and think further about it. Um, I'd probably want to write on this, actually. It's really interesting. Um, one thing that springs to mind is that whenever I uh, was in meetings at Facebook and I would be like, we're an American company and blah, 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 I would get stopped. We are a global company, Kara. Um, so, and, and that's something that I actually had to train myself to think through. And the reason that they were doing that, especially in the beginning of, you know, uh, the noobs, as they called us when we first got there, it was because 
Um, obviously, these um, systems have been incubated and they've thrived in a, in a specific system, you know, Facebook's incorporated in Delaware, um, yet their policies have to work in a bunch of different countries. Um, nowhere is this more stark than with GDPR uh, in, in Europe and Germany. I mean, they're starting to sort of feel the effects of um, more stringent uh, privacy regimes there. Um, but I think private companies, the calculus that they're making, um, and this is evident in their risk mitigation strategies and, and whatnot, is that that um, we, we do what works best for the company that we, or in the country that we exist in that day. Um, they have offices in Singapore and Sao Paulo um, and all these places, and they have to make sure that they're conforming to um, the official, not just the, I wouldn't say necessarily the societal um, desires and mores, but but more so the law enforcement because they're they're concerned. Um, they are concerned about brand and reputation, but they're also getting concerned about getting shut down. Um, you look at Google and Dragonfly and trying to make incursions into the Chinese market multiple times. Um, you know, companies are, I, I wouldn't say they're, you know, uh, morally bankrupt in that way. Um, but there is sort of, um, as I talked about before, value judgments that need to sort of be made at the highest level, um, whether or not we want to uh, be complicit in the censorship by the Chinese government. So I think when those moral issues are kind of black and white, companies are realizing that their brand and reputation um, is going to suffer. Uh, but you have to go back to the fact that, you know, 80% of Facebook, 86% of Facebook's user base is outside the U.S. and North, uh, North America, Mexico, so Mexico um, and Canada and the U.S. Um, so they're growing rapidly in places other than here. Um, so they're really trying to get a foothold there and, you know, uh, do whatever they have to do in terms of data and conform to the data um, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it ideologies, but the data uh, practices of those countries, both officially and then how um, society informs those official regimes and whatnot. Um, so it's a tricky question. I think it one that it, it, it it's worth exploring, um, especially if you guys haven't seen um, Anne Marie Slaughter um, in New America. She came out with an article this morning. It's pretty interesting, and it touches exactly on this point where she talks about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and how they say, you know, we need to have universally applied digital rules for the world. <laughs> um, so something like that, it, it could be um, it, it could be an option in my mind. Um, it, it's tough. I mean, you talk about, you know, the teeth that the UN does or does not have right now in terms of, you know, you have human rights violators going up there and saying, you know, Hong Kong protests are, are terrible, that kind of thing. And you're like, really, the UN right, right now? Like, are you, do you really have any authority to, to be saying that if you're giving these people platforms? Um, so my idea upon first blush, um, just instinctually, uh, a universally applied digital set of rules um, is going to be tough. Um, but I do think that we have to we have to think about governance um, in terms of AI and what values we and principles we want to imbue there. Like if we don't set the rules of the road, China is going to set the rules of the road, and and they have been doing so again surreptitiously in a lot of these standards bodies dictating how technology is used by everyone. Um, so we need to think about you know what kind of society we want technology to reflect because it will reflect society. Should it be a free and open one or a closed repressive one? So we are losing. <laughs> uh, I don't have much to add to that, so I'll defer to Vivek and Klang. Uh, yeah, so much, so much to say on this. Uh, so it's, it's an excellent question. So I would say first and foremost, uh, data transport and data usage and, and other data rules that are being enacted by governments right now um, are a demonstration of how nations are reasserting sovereignty on the digital space. So we had this moment, this kind of Goldilocks moment, where the internet was borderless and the world was all unified and everything's great. Uh, we are all now being disabused of that. So uh, when I talk to Facebook, uh, I remind them, no, you are not a global company. You are an American company who operates globally. How does that go? <laughs> well, then I say, and if you want to, to test that proposition, feel free to incorporate somewhere else and see if you can be you in China. See if you can be you, frankly, in India. I mean, in terms of thinking through the implications of things like, um, you know, requiring that, that 
certain data stay within certain borders. Again, that is nations reasserting sovereignty. And the internet isn't borderless. The internet exists on infrastructure, and that infrastructure is geolocated. So what's happening now is, is kind of the idealized internet and infrastructure of the world. That, that's all falling away to the reality. And until Facebook has guns, it's going to be, it's, it, and not just Facebook, I mean, there's no reason to kind of pick on them, but until these internet companies have the ability to compel others, they're going to be dependent on, this dependent on those who can compel them and who are compelling them. I mean, there's a reason why the United States Congress had the CEO of Facebook before them testifying and asking him specifically, why didn't you do more to prevent foreign influence? Right? And that's because the national security burden is migrating into the private sector. That is inescapable. I realize how complicating that is and how difficult that makes everybody's life, both the state and the private sector. Got it. But that is an unavoidable, unwindable reality. And it is where we are going and is where we are. And so data law and how we treat those things are the primary mechanism by which that is being unfolded. Right? And then the final point I'll say on this is that there are other actors in the international system who get a vote. Mm -hmm. So I can talk to you about how I think these sh things should be done. And frankly, I think the United States and the Western model in general is the most liberating free way that we can kind of do this. Mm -hmm. At the same time, China has a very, frankly, coherent and aggressive strategy at reasserting itself internationally through the leadership on technology issues. Mm -hmm. It is forcing companies to choose a flag, mm -hmm. deliberately so. Correct. And companies aren't going to get to avoid that, right? So this Goldilocks moment that we've been enjoying, it's still here presently, but much like a man who's been shot in the head kind of stumbles forward for a couple of feet, we're stumbling forward right now, but th those days are ending. And, I'm, and I just want to be very clear, me recognizing this reality is not me advocating for it. I think that's something that must be understood. So this is a conversation we are having of the possibilities. It is not something that anyone is proposing. Right. Vic, do you want to add something to me? No, no. I okay. Don't. So I'm going to bring two last interventions. I saw your hand and uh, Jaivir. Uh, sorry, and Shruti. Uh, so uh, Shruti, why don't you ask your... You've been waiting. Thanks very much. You guys are rock stars. It's been a fascinating panel. Um, quickly, you preempted my first question, which was, you know, I'm worried about my job in, in terms of, you know, what is the... Wait, that you always do, but now second question. National... <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, we all should. Don't bully. So um, how does, you know, you know, how did the national security decision-making space change? And given the fascinating scenarios that you guys laid out, what is the time frame? You know, what are, I mean, how are we thinking about this? Second, in terms of the scope of the challenges that you laid out, let's also get prescriptive. So can we, you know, are there things that we can mitigate? Are there checks and balances that you guys are thinking thinking about as to how we're going to, you know, battle this in the future? No, mitigate what? Mitigate the 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 bad values going into AI. Mitigate the growth of China in the tech sector. No, the the possibility of manipulation. Manipulation. Okay, and, and the final intervention. Let's just take these two and then close it with the final comments. Thank you. I have the same question that Jeff asked in the beginning about the U.S. cyber preparedness or cyber maturity just on India. So how successful was India in recruiting talent uh, talent that Sean mentioned, but also just broader cybersecurity uh, talent uh, for private and, and government institutions? How successful was it to build up capabilities, institutional and legal, and so on? And how important is the U.S. in all that? I think that kind of ties in with the question I had posed in the very beginning that I'll come at the end to ask you on what India and U.S. can do, what is India bringing to the table, uh, and what is U.S. offering uh, uh, India in terms of navigating this new geopolitical space that we just outlined over the last 90 minutes. I think that could be one aspect all of you could comment on. On uh, uh, Shruti's point, um, uh, how are we uh, looking at, as governments and communities, responding to uh, the public bads, the digital public bads. We keep talking about the digital public goods, mm -hmm. so, you know. All right, so we take that first and we'll come back to India? No, you can do now both of them. Yeah. Okay. Both of them uh, in response to Shruti, I will latch onto that word of mitigation, right? How, how can we mitigate 
some of these issues. And I think the first is an objective understanding that AI is not some objectively true computational thing that's perfect. It is a creation and a reflection of human endeavor. That means it comes with human biases and possibly human faults or human coded faults into it that they're then exacerbated by its own machine learning as it ingests data. So that's the first realization. In order to try to mitigate and limit those problems, you want to be doing uh, very clear oversight of coding, some degree of transparency, maybe not publicly, but certainly if you have a defense contractor doing an AI situational awareness system, you're going to want to be in a C team looking at the lines of coding, not just the outputs from the black box. You're going to want to have trial runs. You know, when Microsoft ran an AI program for a California police jurisdiction, it suddenly started suggesting that African Americans and Latinos should be stopped and frisked more often than whites. Now, why is that? Because it had studied the data from the human police officers, and it was copying them. Okay? These are the kind of things you have to prepare for, actually expect, and make sure you obviate. Uh, back to our Cuban Missile Crisis, you're going to have to do supply chain security to protect and insulate these systems during their inception, training, and implementation phases if you ultimately want to be able to rely on them. So I guess my comment is not a fear of the technology. I believe it is inevitable and it's going to come to be used in all these capacities we've discussed but you have to have a sincere appreciation of its strengths and its potential weaknesses. Uh, to India very briefly, I see India's play or relevance in this at three levels. First of all, it is undeniable the educated talent base in computer science and programming. Lar uh, you know, India serves as the back office for many global companies. Undeniably, Indian citizens and companies will play a substantial role in this ecosystem. What leadership roles or what leadership sectors they take leadership in remains to be seen. Uh, secondly, more than a billion people, data. Probably after China, you have the second largest data possibilities as you bring your population online and into the modern, uh, much more of your population into the modern developed era. The third play I see is more traditional and political. As the largest democracy, but also as the former head of the non-aligned movement. You know, we've talked about you buying weapon systems from both Russia and the United States. We see your interactions in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, as well in Western-leaning like-minded circles at, whether it's the UNGGE or elsewhere, right? Uh, I see India's voice as being very substantial here not only in its own right for its population and in the tech sector, but also as a figure that much of the global south looks to as a honest arbiter between those other giant powers, my country included, who are competing in this arms race. So I certainly see a role for India's voice in this. I think India has to do a, a little more for itself, figuring out what it wants that voice to be on the global stage. Yeah, I think you gave a pretty um, fulsome rundown of the how we can defend ourselves technically um, against some of the, the issues that you mentioned or that we've all mentioned too. Um, I would add to the technical portion that, um, you know, increasing investments in R&D uh, can really help and, and India can do that too. Um, it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's almost that simple, but like we're going to have to grow the overall pie in R&D investments if we're going to get to where we think we need to be. And that's when democratic free societies sort of dominate the, the uses of technology going into the future. Um, you know, you mentioned timeframes, you know, even as far as five years from now, that kind of thing. Um, and then I would also say when we're talking about uh, guarding against synthetic media, um, increasingly lifelike bots, um, uh, uses of natural language processing, applications of machine learning, really, that could um, work in the information environment um, against democracies and serve to undermine our institutions. Um, that includes things like automated market targeting at, at scale as well. Um, then there is a, and I won't talk too much about the technical stuff about coding defect detection algorithms to see if things have been tampered with. Is this real or not? Even labeling bots, that helps like let people decide uh, if they want to believe something's true or not, but just be more transparent transparent about if it's been digitally modified. Um, so that's all important too. But there is something that I'll just kind of 
mention at a cursory level um, is the, the idea of resilience um, in society and the inoculation to these kinds of things. Like people talk about media literacy, um, education is really important, um, but but I also think that, you know, society, like we have individual responsibility abilities and critical thinking, um, uh, you know, necessities that yeah, as individuals, you know, we, we have responsibilities for how we act and how we ingest things and, and what we do. Um, I, I don't want to pretend that tech companies are going to save the world or the government is going to save the world. When it comes down to it, um, you know, you have to localize responsibility for things. And sometimes it's it's your own fault uh, based off of your own confirmation biases and whatnot. So I think humans need to take responsibility as individuals for the things that they believe in, the actions that result from that. Um, so the so societal media literacy inoculation portion is um, pretty important. In terms of being prescriptive, um, I think I talked about it earlier, imposing higher costs on individuals and companies. Um, in the US, we have mechanisms for doing so. Um, the Commerce Department Entity List, the Magnitsky Act, that kind of thing. So if certain companies like Thermo Fisher are uh, complicit in gross human rights abuses, they were using um, some DNA research uh, on the population in Xinjiang, um, then you know sometimes you need to impose costs on those individuals, like individual academic researchers who contributed to some of the, the use of that. Um, where is this technology going? Super hard to, to figure out exactly. Again, tech is so diffuse now. It's hard to, you know, put um, export controls on math, <laughs> you know. So um, that's something that we have to consider. And you have to work with a scalpel, not a sledgehammer, when you're sort of um, talking about visiting these uh, legislative mechanisms against people and companies. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, working together, India, I, I don't really know too much about India's investments in cybersecurity and whatnot, but I do know that we have of compatible systems of governance. And um, the more that we talk about it uh, together, it, it, it's going to go better for us in that way. So a little bit squishy, but we're friends. We should stay friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll address one aspect of your question that, that wasn't touched, if I understood it correctly. And that is kind of, hey, where are we on all this? Can we actually do this stuff yet? Um, on things like, it's uneven. The short answer is it's, it's uneven. Uh, on things like image recognition, yeah, we're, we're there. Like we we can we can do that really really well uh, to the degree that in terms of the intelligence community we probably don't need half of the personnel dedicated to looking at satellite photos that I mean I'm not advocating for that again you know to my fellow brethren but in terms of functionality and Already capability some minutes worried about jobs here uh, <laughs> sorry you know um, you know so so in, in terms of that capability yes uh, we're we're largely there and and in some other things I think the bigger point on this that for, for a significant portion of time, it was understood that, oh, AI is really going to only affect these kind of routine uh, mm. tasks. I think we're waking up to the reality that that might not actually be the case, that, that, that the implication and application of artificial intelligence may be more broad than we thought. There are certain things that it, it can't do, certainly. But, um, for example, in the medical field, AI is doing some pretty good um, medical diagnostic work and um, identifying cancers and things like that. Um, one of the ways that might actually impact, say, the medical field is people who are, you know, doctors, the, the, the kind of people that we look up to and say, like, wow, that's, that's amazing. Much of that job could actually be transformed, if AI is broadly applied, to largely being a technician, to, to kind of implementing the prescription, the prescribed, r rather than like doing all the kind of cool, heady work that we associate with doctors now. And that's going to apply equally in, uh, in the national security field. Um, analysts, certainly the majority of the, of, the, of the change that's going to happen in the near term is, is people running with machines. Okay. So a lot of the work that takes up time of just being doing like normal analytic work, of going out and finding information and scouring information, that will be much more efficient. Uh, it'll be less of a pull and more pushed. Um, the AI, you know, to put it in, in concrete terms, um, I'll simply turn to an AI and say, hey, you know, what's the, what's the percentage of China's GDP on, you know, ag, you know, corn product, whatever, right? And it will go out and scour sources of information that I could never have access to or, 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 or never kind of get all of and come back with, with a response. And that took me 30 seconds rather than a day, right? And then I'll advance it from there and I'll leverage it. So those types of things are happening. Uh, 
we want to be careful not to buy into some of the marketing that's going on. But again, AI actually does have the ability, I think, to live up to much of the hype that's out there. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add uh, very briefly, Samir, um, something we haven't discussed on this panel, but we've talked a lot about artificial intelligence. Uh, on, in terms of non-artificial intelligence and human resources, I think from a U.S.-India perspective, um, for, in terms of prescriptions and what we can do, is skill development, and skill development in all these areas, and that's a huge potential. I think still is being tapped in a limited way, but uh, that has limitless potential. Uh, Vivek, I want to ask you one last question uh, before we close this panel and um, uh, go for a tea break. On the uh, on the India US dimension that you just mentioned and the mm -hmm. others have engaged with, on, with uh, do you do you see a realization in your inter Indian counterparts to start thinking of this as a domain to be engaged with? So is you've been working in India and engaging with India for a long time. Yes, I do. I I, I see a huge trust, a, a huge awareness. I think awareness is the first step, and uh, you know I cannot say enough about the encouragement that has been given to startups in India and the number of startups that have come up in the last few years. And I think that provides a, a really hotbed of talent and innovation mm -hmm. that has to be leveraged. So I think we were yesterday uh, morning, we were thinking about what could be the next big idea for the India-US partnership. The last 10 years centered around the nuclear agreement and the expanded defense partnership, which is now $20 billion strong. And of course, uh, the larger economic dimensions what could be the mojo for the relationship going ahead? And could a uh, India-US partnership on the future of technology and the future of living with technology be one of those areas? Uh, being liberal, democratic, uh, largely free and open society, then I say largely because both of us have our own lunatics uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that continue to challenge that. But uh, uh, I think as those who are on the same spectrum of, of uh, free speech and uh, liberal thinking, uh, this could be an area where we must work together. Uh, and uh, I think the four of uh, the panelists this morning have given us enough food for thought. And now we only need a cup of tea. But before that, uh, join me in applauding their wonderful interventions this morning.